welcome and thanks to you all for being here, both those of you in the room today and uh, all of those who are able to join us via the webcast uh, as well. Um, before we begin the panel, I, I want to make two quick housekeeping points. Um, the first is that we are joined today uh, by two illustrious uh, colleagues from Intel and Google. So I would be remiss if I didn't disclose that Brookings uh, has received funding from each uh, in the past. The other is that uh, we'll be opening, opening the floor to questions about halfway through the event. Um, as many of you are aware, AI is rapidly transforming a number of domains from education to transportation to national security. And in the process, it has raised no shortage of deep and important ethical questions. Thankfully, at Brookings, we have two esteemed scholars, Bill Galston, a senior fellow in our Governance Studies program here, and Daryl West, uh, the vice president of our Governance Studies program here at Brookings, uh, who have each authored uh, wonderful papers uh, on AI and ethics uh, that are available now on our website. In addition to that, we're also joined today by uh, Heather Patterson, who is a senior research scientist at Intel Labs, and Karina Chu, who is a uh, the global policy lead for emerging technologies at Google. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll jump right into the panel. Um, and I'd like to start with, with Daryl. Uh, Daryl, what, what I admired most about uh, your paper is that you don't just describe uh, the, the challenges uh, uh, that AI introduces. You also offer a set of policy guidelines and solutions. Uh, would you mind speaking a bit uh, broadly about why the ethics of AI are so challenging and, and why they require the, the guidelines that you lay out? Okay, uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, so my paper looks at the role of corporations in AI development because we're obviously seeing tremendous advances in AI over many sectors, finance, transportation, healthcare, education, defense, and sustainability, among other uh, topics. Uh, I have a new book out on the future of work, and I argue that people are gonna be very surprised how rapidly the AI and machine learning and data analytics revolution accelerates in uh, coming years. The growing role of AI is going to raise a number of different ethical dilemmas, which I discuss in the paper. This includes the use of AI for weapons development and military applications, its use in uh, law enforcement and border enforcement, its role in government surveillance, uh, the issue of racial bias in AI uh, systems, and social credit systems, uh, kind of online rating systems uh, that measure people's trustworthiness. Now, some of these problems I think are going to require government action. Uh, for example, in the discrimination area, I think we clearly uh, need to have very strong anti-discrimination laws specifically applied to artificial intelligence. There's gonna be a need for privacy protections and outlining uh, legal rights governing the use of AI in uh, different areas. But in an, area, in an era of uh, gridlock and polarization, I think it's gonna be difficult for political leaders to build majorities in favor of significant action, at least in the next uh, couple of years. It's actually hard to imagine uh, Congress passing uh, legislation in the next couple of years uh, in these areas, uh, or uh, bills like that being signed by uh, President Trump. We also have the challenge of uh, what in the paper I referred to as dual use technologies, uh, in which many emerging technologies can be used either for good or for ill. Uh, for example, facial recognition software can help law enforcement find abducted children, but then it also can empower sweeping intrusions into uh, personal uh, privacy. So it's often hard to build regulatory regimes uh, in these areas. In the past, it took years to figure out how to regulate airplanes, automobiles, and nuclear energy. And in fact, uh, now decades later, uh, we still uh, make adjustments along the way in terms of how we uh, feel and deal with uh, those uh, types of technologies. So in the paper, I focus on the role of corporations in terms of what I think they should be doing and how uh, they should be thinking about ethics in the deployment of uh, these uh, technologies because I think in the short run, this is where the real action is going to be uh, taking 
place. There are many companies, uh, such as Microsoft and Google, that already have put out uh, detailed uh, plans. Uh, Intel, Apple, and many others are in the process of formulating their own uh, uh, plans. So in the paper, I argue that companies should think about six very specific types of actions in order to make sure ethics are taken seriously in uh, AI deployment. Uh, one, they should hire ethicists to work with their corporate decision makers. Uh, two, they should develop an ethics uh, code that lays out how various uh, issues are going to be handled. Three, they should have an AI review board that addresses ethical uh, questions on an ongoing basis. Four, they need to develop AI audit trails that show how various coding decisions have been made. I think this is especially going to be important as particular problems start to come before the courts. It's going to be very difficult to inspect the millions of lines of code that exist in most software uh, programs, but you can have an annotated audit trail that describes the decision those software designers have made made as they were writing the code so that others can understand the choices and that the rest of us can think about the possible ramifications of uh, their decisions. Fifth, I'd like to see companies implement AI training programs for their staff that operation, operationalizes ethical considerations. And then finally, there needs to be a means of remediation in those cases where AI solutions end up inflicting harm or damages on consumers. So I think all those things uh, would help a lot, and they're ideas that can be implemented, uh, implemented uh, very quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. I, I think uh, it's very apt that you talk a lot about the ethics of corporations around AI in particular. Uh, fortunately, we're joined here uh, by an ethicist at one of the leading uh, technology corporations, uh, Intel. Um, Heather, uh, you've also worked on principles around AI and ethics, and I was wondering if you could lay out some of the, the principles that you uh, believe corporations should follow as well. I would love to, and, and thank you for having me here today. I, it's, it's lovely to be here. And I will say that although Intel is currently working on principles, uh, those are not public yet, and so I won't talk about our specific principles. But I will add actually three things, Daryl, that I think could be added to your recommendations, and that may you know, sound surprising for someone coming from a technology company. Um, but I think we can do even more. So I think it's important to think, first of all, uh, that AI, can everybody hear me, by the way? Thank you very much for telling me. Ah. <laughs> ah. So I think it's important to, to realize when we talk about artificial intelligence that AI isn't one thing. It's a constellation of things. It's a constellation of sensors and machine learning techniques and algorithms and data collection and processing uh, data collection and processing processes and uh, and it's not just something that occurs inside of a computer it's something that occurs in it in reaction to in conjunction with real people and because this involves real people the problems are hard we can't engineer our way out of them we need real people to be working on them with us and so one of the first things that occurred to me when i was reading your paper is i think it's wonderful to call on corporations to bring ethicists into the room but i would even step back and say we need to get all of the right people in the room so not just business leaders and strategists and technologists and ethicists, but also the people who have the ability to do deep dives into the social context in which AI systems and products are deployed. So the social scientists, the anthropologists and the sociologists and the cognitive psychologists and so on. Because in order to really understand the effects of a particular technology, you need to look at the social norms that inhere within a particular context, like home life, or the workplace, or a retail space, or a public park, or a street. Um, and really, it's important to interrogate what a buzzword that's popular now, human-centric AI, interrogate what that buzzword means and translate that to design principles. And we're going to see challenges around this, and I can talk about it in a bit, with implementations like the Internet of Things. Second, 
not only should the right people be in the room, but those people need to have all of the information that they need in order to make the right decisions. And so I think it's important, companies have an obligation to reduce information asymmetries. And so we talk a lot about transparency, explainability, explicability. Um, that refers to a constella uh, also a constellation of concepts, um, but let's come back to that. Uh, third, I think it's very important to have accountability and oversight in design and implementation. So I talked about context. Uh, it's important that artificial intelligence implementations be contextually and culturally sensitive. Those also need to be backstopped by very clear guardrails so we know what companies will and won't do. Um, so we can look to things like internationally accepted human rights principles, the fair information practice principles, rules of war. We're not starting from scratch here, but we do need to very, be very clear about where uh, those backstops place us in the ecosystem. Thank you, Heather. Um, I think where you ended uh, is actually a great point uh, to start with, with, with Bill, which is kind of some of the international um, regulations and norms we've developed. And Bill, I, you know, if, if you haven't read it yet, I highly recommend Bill's paper. It's really, he does a masterful job uh, laying out a lot of the ethics of, of AI. And I, I want to start uh, with one of the points you made in the conclusion, which is that uh, you note that, you know, in domain after domain, one of the most, uh, what most ethical concerns over AI share in common is a, a need for the, or the a keen awareness of the limits of self-regulation and the need for government oversight. Um, so what, what is it about AI in your view uh, that will require that kind of government oversight? Well, as they say in Washington, I'm glad you asked. Uh, I am all in favor of maximum feasible, you know, ethically aware corporate self-regulation. In my judgment, and it's not my judgment alone, as you'll find out in a minute, that is necessary, but it will not be sufficient. Uh, Daryl, in his opening statement, indicated that it might be a while before legislation catches up to social impact and social change. Uh, as a matter of prediction, that may be true. Uh, but my argument is that the closer we can get to getting out in front of these changes that are going to be so transformative and bring the capacity of democratic decision making to bear on these incipient social transformations, the better off we're going to be. Right now, we are still living with the consequences of a profound technologically driven economic transition where we didn't get out in front of the social consequences. And look at what's happened to the politics of democracies throughout the West, in part as a consequence of that. I said that this view is not mine alone. And let me read you a paragraph from a very, very well-crafted memorandum. Uh, Facial recognition technology raises issues that go to the heart of fundamental human rights protections like privacy and freedom of expression. These issues heighten responsibility for tech companies that create these products. In our view, they also call for thoughtful government regulation and for the development of norms around acceptable uses. In a democratic republic, there is no substitute for decision making by our elected representatives regarding the issues that require the balancing of public safety with the essence of our democratic freedoms. I agree with every word of that paragraph which was written this July by Brad Smith, who is the president of Microsoft. Uh, and for those of you who have not read his memorandum, Facial Recognition Technology, The Need for Public Regulation and Corporate Responsibility, it is, I think, required reading for people who are interested in this field. There are a number of different reasons why you need government regulation to backstop corporate self-regulation. One of them, not the only one by any means, is that whenever you have self-regulation, there is a self the first mover advantage for the person who breaks the norms in one way or another. 
And that advantage is typically enough to induce one or more actors to deviate from the norms. When that happens, a kind of Gresham's law sets in where bad behavior drives out good behavior. A classic, defense, a classic reason for government is to have a club in the closet to reduce the incentives for a single agent to break, three, break free of binding social norms. We are finding out the hard way in this country what happens when institutions and practices backstopped by norms but not by law are violated. And I'm not sure we want to go any farther down that road. I have lots, to th lots of things to say in my paper about facial recognition technology, about autonomous vehicles, and about AI-guided weapons development. Suffice it to say that the issue at stake is nothing less than what kind of society we want to be living in in the next 10 or 20 years. Do we, for example, want to live in a society that is subject to universal surveillance? As we now know, that is not only a technological possibility, but very close to a technological reality. I can think of lots of advantages. The Brits just you know, succeeded through universal surveillance and identifying the people who are probably responsible uh, for the Skripal uh, affair although they claim that they were in Salisbury as tourists, which is akin, in my judgment, to claiming that Rick was in Casablanca for the waters. But, really, but do we really want to live in that kind of society? Let's call it China for short. I don't. But I think we're going to need affirmative steps by government to prevent that from happening. Thank you, Bill. I want to turn now to Karina. And, um, Google has been uh, in the news for a lot of its you know, AI for good efforts. Uh, it's also been in, in the news for you know, things like Project Maven. And in response to that, over the summer, it released some principles uh, that it was going to abide by uh, around AI. And I'd appreciate it if you could talk about those. Sure. Thanks, Chris. And hi, everyone. Um, I would say you know, to set the stage really at Google, we firmly believe that AI is a technology with enormous opportunity for societal benefit. Um, to give you some context, I joined Google almost four years ago, and at that time, fewer than five or ten percent of our engineers had machine learning training. Um, today, um, more than 21,000 engineers have been trained with our machine learning crash course at the company, um, and that course is now available online um, in multiple languages for anybody to take. I would say this is, you know, just one indication of how important uh, AI is to the company, and I think, uh, you know, you. Think about Google products, right? Um, the opportunity to better understand search queries, the opportunity to serve users in not just English, but in hundreds of languages, to help understand content beyond just text, right? Today, a lot of the content there is video and image and audio. It's a lot more complex. So we found that we absolutely need machine learning to adapt to a lot of these questions. Um, better translations and translate, all of that is powered by advances in machine learning. Um, you know, Google works on a lot of hard problems, but it's really only a fraction of the problems that exist in the world today. Um, so if you think about, you know, translations that can maybe help doctors communicate better with patients who speak another language or image recognition for earlier detection of cancer, right? These are all things that we see as enormous opportunities. Um, often if we get the question, is it ethical to pursue AI? I think the flip side of that question is, given all of these potential opportunities, is it ethical not to pursue AI, right? What are all the potential benefits we would be foregoing if we did not pursue it? So for Google, the clear answer is that we absolutely um, should need to want to pursue AI. That being said, I think it's not enough to just lead in the development of AI technology. Um, as Chris noted and others, right, there are many potential risks and consequences if the technology is developed in the wrong way or possibly, you know, applied to harmful purposes. Um, something that we are doing, our approach to self-regulation at this point is really thinking through what does it mean not just to be a leader in AI technology, but also a leader in the responsible development and use of the technology. And that was really the context for us to put together a set of Google AI principles. You can read them on our website. You know, there's two 
reasons for this, two purposes for this set of principles. Number one, of course, publicly, it's our way to share externally how we're thinking about how we're approaching AI technology. But also, number two, internally, it's our way to assess various features and um, products and deals and applications and new ideas even research that we might be pursuing, right? Every new opportunity, we're using these AI principles as a framework to assess um, the various uh, options and see whether or not um, this is in line with our principles or not. In addition to our principles in which we lay out seven things AI should do or be um, and four red lines, we also released a set of responsible AI practices. You can also find this at the Google AI website. This is a very detailed set of technical practices, right? A lot of times people say, great, you know, I also care about fairness and privacy and accountability and, and safety. These are all really good things, but how do you actually live up to that, right? To Heather's point, how do you build that into your products? What are technical steps that you can take? And we have very detailed technical steps at our responsible AI practices. The idea there is Google's doing a lot in AI, but actually right now, a lot of people are using AI, right? The barrier is getting lowered. There's so many opportunities for people to to use AI for the problems that they care about. Um, they should also have responsibility for the things that they're developing. And what we can do at Google is uh, really share the best of what we know. Um, you'll notice that they're called responsible AI practices, not best practices, because we don't think that we really know best yet at this point. To be honest, we don't think it's early days, we don't really think anybody knows best, but we are keeping that updated every quarter so we really can share the latest of what we know and what we recommend at this point. Um, of course, we're thinking through internal governance. We have a lot of things that we're working on there, how we actually implement the principles at Google. And maybe the point I'll leave this on is uh, we really just are one of many players, right? I think there are a lot of voices that need um, to take part in this conversation. Um, but as Google, we absolutely want to collaborate on um, doing our part to develop this in a responsible way. Thank you, Karina. Um, uh, it's been a wonderful uh, opening uh, round of questions and remarks. Uh, I'm going to exercise a, a bit of moderator's prerogative and, and ask a, a couple of follow-ups before we turn it to the audience. Um, Daryl, I wanted to start with you, which is that um, I think one of the most interesting things about reading your paper uh, against uh, and, and reading bills at the same time is that there's this tension between, on the one hand, we want to rein in uh, the abuse of AI by companies, and so we want government to have more uh, oversight. On the other hand, we're also um, very much concerned about the abuses of uh, coupling or the, the possibilities that emerge when you couple AI with state power. And so I'm, I'd be curious for your thoughts on how to navigate that tension. Okay, uh, great question, thank you very much. Uh, I actually agree with uh, Bill that AI does uh, pose a particular uh, risk. I mean, he gave the example of facial recognition software and how uh, some countries around the world are really uh, using this in uh, detrimental uh, ways. Uh, that clearly is a very problematic uh, subject, especially in the hands of uh, law enforcement. Uh, so there needs to be uh, some uh, government action there. Uh, ditto in terms of racial bias uh, types of uh, uh, questions. Uh, we know that uh, uh, at least some, perhaps a lot of the data being used to train AI systems either are incomplete or outright uh, biased. Uh, in facial recognition, for example, AI uh, is much better at recognizing Caucasian than minority uh, faces. So for example, uh, for darker skinned women, uh, uh, AI uh, image uh, software has about a 35% error rate. For darker skinned men, it has a 12% uh, error rate. Uh, the uh, Caucasian uh, rate is uh, much lower than either one of those uh, figures. And so that kind of illustrates how data biases can become AI uh, biases. And so we really need non-discrimination uh, principles applied uh, to uh, various uh, types of emerging uh, technologies. But when you incorporate the governance angle in uh, these types of uh, questions, and given the very difficult political situation that we face uh, now, especially at the national level, you know, I think it, it's going to take several years uh, to even get to the point where it may be possible to pass legislation through Congress, uh, get a president to uh, sign this. I don't think we have that much time. Uh, 
when you look at how AI is already being uh, deployed in terms of autonomous vehicles, like self-driving cars are not about the cars. It's about the AI. The AI is what integrates the LIDAR information, the uh, imaging uh, data, the sensor uh, uh, information in real time so you don't have a an accident. Uh, that stuff is going to be on the road starting uh, next year. Uh, finance uh, software is deploying AI. Healthcare uh, is uh, deploying uh, AI. So I think companies have to be much more transparent about how they're thinking about AI development and deployment. They have to be transparent about how they're making the decisions and how they are incorporating ethical values in their uh, decisions. We've actually done a series of uh, monthly public opinion uh, surveys on public attitudes uh, towards various emerging technologies. So for example, in May, we published a survey about attitudes towards AI. And we found considerable fears about the AI impact on jobs, on personal privacy, uh, a worry that robots and AI are gonna be taking over from humans. Uh, Companies have to take these fears seriously so that they do not provoke a tech lash, kind of the backlash against technology that we already see starting uh, to emerge uh, in society as a whole. If the public concern becomes too widespread, it's actually going to guarantee very tough government regulation down the road. So companies better take this seriously if they want to maintain the public trust. Thanks, Daryl. I, I want to pull off on, on a couple of the points you made about bias in particular and, and uh, ask Heather, um, you know, uh, one of the things that you work on is explainable AI um, and how uh, that form of AI can potentially uh, mitigate some of the, the bias issues. Thank you. I think it's an incredibly important point uh, that we need greater transparency and greater explainability where possible. And so to that end, I would say, you know, there are some types of AI where explainability at this point from a technical standpoint just isn't possible. But that doesn't mean that we can't invest significant resources as a society, but technology companies in particular, in finding ways to make uh, more, to make clearer um, what parameters are being assessed by a particular uh, machine learning model and how those parameters are being weighted to make decisions so that we don't have problems like facial recognition uh, algorithms, not recognizing brown-skinned people as, uh, as accurately as white-skinned people. That's hugely problematic. Um, we need to understand other things like uh, how do we let individual users of the technology know, understand when it is they're being monitored, when their information is being collected, who it's being transmitted to, and for what purposes. We haven't built a lot of that into technology uh, right now, but looking forward, we may have an opportunity to do so. So explainability, we look at explainability um, from the aims and purposes of the system to the quality of the data that's being collected, making sure that the representation in the database that the machine learning models are using is appropriate for that use. And thinking also about um, the effects that our technology, all of our technologies are having on real world communities post deployment. So we put all of that into the bucket of explainable AI and say, we do need to be having this conversation. We do need to be working with parties um, across sectors and we do need to prioritize this as a society. Could I add to that really quick? Chris, I um, completely agree with Heather. I think fairness and explainability is crucial for AI systems. I did wanna make the point that actually many of these machine learning systems can help us to be you know, even more responsible than we are today as humans, right? It's important to develop them responsibly, but also they can help us to be even better. So in the case of fairness, a um, few years ago, Google worked with the Gina Davis Institute to look through thousands of hours of movie and television footage. Um, and they had one question, you know, how often do men have screen time and speaking roles and how often do women have screen time? 
and speaking roles. We partnered with them using a Google machine learning model that's able to identify male faces and female faces to automatically annotate um, the thousands and thousands of hours of footage, right? That's something that would not have been possible without machine learning model, right? Nobody's going to sit there and, and just mark it. But what they found is, um, maybe not surprisingly, men have a significant majority of speaking time and screen time relative to women. And um, what was a little bit surprising was actually that in uh, movies that had female at least 50% of the screen and speaking time, um, if not more, they actually performed better at the box office. So these are real stats that um, were made possible through the use of machine learning. I think that's um, really important to note. On the idea of explainability, I think the same thing, right? It's absolutely important to have explainability in our machine learning models, but actually they might be able to help us explain more about decisions than we can today as humans. My husband is an oncologist, so he sees cancer patients all the time. And, you know, sometimes, you know, it's very clear what they have, but sometimes he just has a feeling, right? He can say, uh, I have a, th a, a sense that maybe you should go back for another PET scan or you should um, maybe get rechecked. I feel like you know, cancer is metastasizing. Not really sure, not really able to pinpoint it exactly. Usually he's right, but it's really that intuition. With machine learning systems, and it's still early days, but they're getting better, there's actually the opportunity to uh, identify why a certain decision is being made, right? Today, especially, there's been a lot of progress in explainability of uh, machine vision systems, being able to look at an image and say, all right, I think there's a detection of a tumor, but not just yes or no. Um, here's the section where I think tumor cells are existing, right? And here are the previous 10 examples that this model saw before, which is leading it to this decision. So I did want to make that point. Thanks so much for jumping in. I just want to build on that a little bit. I absolutely agree. Um, I think we also need to make sure that professionals like oncologists and others do have the opportunity to weigh in so that these decisions, when we think about deployment of AI technologies, the decisions aren't just made by themselves and they don't just necessarily take effect, at least until some generally accepted level of accuracy has been achieved and we're all comfortable with that as a society. We don't wanna cut out human expertise when there may be, we may need to build in opportunities for the humans who are professionals in their own domains to take a look at those scans and say, hey, actually, you know, the system is indicating that there's a tumor here, but I think it's something else. And I think there might be, you know, something going on over here. So just remembering that these technologies are being put into place to help people, to serve people, and not to replace people. Um, the second point is, Let's just keep in mind as well that implementation is important. So when you think about algorithmic bias and say facial recognition technologies perhaps not being accurate enough or you know, the flip side of that, great accuracy might in certain implementations actually be problematic. You know, so we talked about surveillance states and autocratic regimes. There might be situations where you want to be cautious about uh, how particular technologies are actually being deployed um, and um, make sure you follow up and uh, remain aligned with the principles that you've set forth as a corporation or as another actor. Completely agree. <laughs> Problem solved. Um, <laughs> Uh, be, be, yeah. <laughs> uh, before we turn it over, I want to ask one last question uh, to, to Bill, which is that uh, we've talked a lot about the ethics of AI. We haven't quite talked that much about moral agency and moral frameworks that we use to, to answer those decisions. One of the things that I liked about your, your paper was in looking at things like driverless cars and autonomous weapons, you, you put the moral agency question to some extent front and center, and I, I'd appreciate your thoughts on uh, you know, specifically who has moral agency with these systems and how it should be used. Well, that is a deep question that I can't possibly answer in a minute or two or three or five or the remaining time for that matter. So suffice it to say that I try to put the problem on the table by working through a series of examples. You know, with regard to driverless cars, you know, here's my example. Uh, the car is driving itself along and then suddenly 
there's a bouncing ball that comes into the road, followed by you know, a four-year-old, a four-year-old running after the ball. Uh, both the human and the autonomous vehicle uh, guidance system would reach the judgment, in this case, let's say, I can't brake in time to avoid hitting the boy. So what do I do? Right? And I work through a series of examples. And one of the points that I make is that what you do may be dependent on who you are, who the other passengers in the car are. You know, for example, uh, if you have your two children in car seats in the back, and you know that if you swerve left and there's an oncoming car, there's a pretty good chance that your car is going to be broadsided and risking harm or even death to your own children. All right, what do you do? In the case, you know, in the case of AI, what does who do, right? How is that autonomous system programmed to deal with morally fraught situations of that sort? And I don't want to sit here and give a glib answer, but I will say that the displacement of that decision from the mother driving the car to some designer, anonymous designer someplace, is not a transfer that I'm comfortable with without having substantial assurance uh, that the sorts of ethical considerations that a parent would bring to that decision have been fully reflected and to a higher degree of accuracy and efficacy than the human mother would be able to reach. And I am far from persuaded that either of those conditions has been satisfied or will soon be satisfied. Um. With that, I will turn it over to the uh, audience um, for Q&A. If, if anybody has any question, please uh, identify yourself um, and uh, state your question as uh, concisely as possible. Um, yes, sir, right here. Thanks. Uh, can Zach, yeah, we've, we've got a, have a mic. Great, thanks. Uh, Zach Biggs, I'm a national security reporter with the Center for Public Integrity. Um, so I wanted to ask, and sort of circling back to the prior mention of Project Maven, but broadly working with the Pentagon as tech companies and working on the AI problem with tech companies. Um, we've seen a little bit of a history of companies being hesitant, whether it's what happened with Boston Dynamics, whether it's Project Maven, um, even with technologies that aren't inherently part of a weapon system. So I guess my, my question, particularly for the two uh, members of the panel from industry, is the problem who the customer is when it comes to working with AI and the government, is the problem that it's the Pentagon, regardless of where the AI is being used, or is the problem the actual application of the AI technology? I'll step in first, given the question uh, and specific um, pieces of it. I will say on Maven, obviously, we have everything that we um, have to say publicly written in blog posts by our CEO, Sundar Pichai, and um, CEO of Google Cloud, Diane Green. Um, but beyond that, um, we outlined our AI principles to really serve as a guide um, guideline gold standard for how we will consider the various projects that we work on. Um, you'll notice we had seven principles um, that outline things that we believe AI should do or should be. Um, we've also outlined four red lines. One of those red lines is that we as a company will want will not work on AI with applications to weapons. So in the case of the specific question that you raised really is in the application of it. We've emphasized multiple times, and this is stated clearly in Diane Green's blog as well, that we are absolutely committed to working with the military and the US government. I think we have a lot of um, ongoing collaborations already. There's a lot of opportunities for continued work in things like search and rescue, in um, healthcare, in education, in disaster relief. Um, so we're absolutely committed to that. And I'll also start by saying I'm a social scientist at Intel. I'm not formally on the policy team, so I, I can't speak to that. But I will say 
uh, a couple of things. I do think that we're having a moment right now in society. And so I think it's interesting that we're seeing among employees of technology companies a lot of interest internally about how their companies are behaving, who they're engaging with, how technology is being deployed, and the effect that it's having on real people in real world communities, and a real sensitivity to that. Um, I don't know uh, that we would out of hand and not engage with particular customers because of a position they hold in society. I, my hunch is that we would look to the principles that we have internally that we're developing, but also our long standing position as a very ethical company and reflect on those and choose projects that are in <coughs> accordance with those guidelines that we have always followed. And if I can add a public opinion uh, component to your uh, question. Uh, we recently did a survey looking at public attitudes towards AI for warfare, so it kind of gets a, uh, the general thrust of your uh, question. We found only 30% of Americans right now support the development, uh, the deployment of AI for uh, purposes of warfare. But then we ask a follow-up question of if we thought our national adversaries were developing AI for warfare, you know, how would you feel about it? The 30% support uh, jumps up to 45% support. So it's how people feel about these issues is not just dependent on either the customer or the application, but how they see uh, the general uh, situation. We also found very significant age and gender differences in how people responded uh, to that, uh, with men being uh, much more supportive of AI for uh, warfare than women and older people, especially senior citizens, uh, compared to uh, younger people uh, being uh, supportive. So I, I thought those were kind of interesting angles on that. Great, thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm, I'm John Piha, Carnegie Mellon University. Um, it's great that companies have general principles, but consumers generally don't know what actual decisions are made on AI issues, nor do shareholders, nor do most employees. Is there any example of a company that has done a good job of being transparent about decisions actually made without a lawsuit or scandal? No. <laughs> Well, I'm going to jump in and disagree with that just a bit. Um, could you clarify a, a bit what you mean on types of decisions? Do you mean decisions in products or decisions about technology uh, in general? I mean, if, well, if technology, I mean, when products or products or services where you've had to make value decisions applying some of the principles that we are talking about and you have let relevant stakeholders understand the, the actually not you, anybody, I'm asking, it doesn't have to be your company, but is there examples where, where meaningful transparency is there so people understand the hard decisions, not just the easy ones or the general principles that have been made? So I'll give a few examples. One on our search product, for example. Anybody can actually go on search. There are search rater guidelines, clear explanations of how uh, search quality is defined, and uh, that dictates you know, the results and the processes by which um, things come up in the search platform. I think there's a lot of opportunities like that um, in other products by other companies, but I'd say in terms of decisions that we've been making with the AI principles that we set out, we absolutely wanted to make those principles public so that everybody could see the types of principles and high-level guidance that we're living by. As I mentioned, we also have the responsible AI practices, which you can check out. They have many, many, many examples of uh, very technical details and decisions that we have in terms of fairness and explainability in privacy and in security. So those are all there. Um, the last thing I would say is, you know, we're thinking through a lot of new issues that are coming up, right, with the advent of machine learning and all these new opportunities, obviously also comes new questions. And they are things that I don't think many people have asked before or have had to ask before. Um, so as these come up, we released our principles a little more than three months ago. I'd say in the three months since then, we've had many different 
um, kind of submissions and things to look at in terms of potential um, research papers and features and products that we might want to launch. Um, we're definitely taking a very close assessment of each of those with respect to the principles and we'll be figuring out kind of the best way to also share and disseminate that information um, in a way that's made public. And if I can just quickly uh, follow up on uh, that. Uh, I mean, when I look at the uh, ethics codes that are coming out from a variety of organizations, I mean, not just businesses, but NGOs, universities, and so on, like, I don't disagree with any of the principles, you know, fairness, safety, transparency, you know, we're all in agreement with that. But I think your question really pinpoint, pinpoints the nub of the problem, which is how do those very general and abstract principles get applied? And I'm sure companies are having a lot of discussions about this, they're actually making decisions, uh, but as you suggest, we don't know the results of those uh, decisions. Uh, so I think companies are gonna have to do better if they want to reassure a general public that is becoming skeptical of a range of new uh, technologies, on not just AI, but driverless cars, uh, robots, facial recognition, and a bunch of other things. I agree, and I think you raise a really important point. Um, it may be that companies have not done a fantastic job about communicating their internal policies and practices up until now, um, but I think we are seeing a, a really concerted effort to be better at this. And so when I talked about transparency and all of the different layers of that, one of those is communicating internally and, and training um, employees, socializing them to uh, the ethical principles that are being developed that we want to see practiced, um, communicating to shareholders, communicating to uh, policymakers, but also communicating with civil society organizations and making sure that uh, they have reviewed principles and practices and making sure that there's buy-in, but also communicating with each other. Um, so there are bodies like AI Now and the Partnership for AI, uh, IEEE, um, and those are all forum, fora, for uh, technologists and business leaders and ethicists to get together to really talk through these problems, um, not just the development of the principles, but the operationalization of those principles in practice. And so one place to look is, for example, IEEE's Ethically Aligned Design uh, white paper that they've published two versions of now, and that is a 250-something page paper that lays out most of the ethical issues associated uh, with artificial intelligence now. Um, there's been a call, uh, the public comment call may be over that window, but a call for um, contributions from people throughout the world, and there's an interest in translating those into a series of standards, the P700, the P7000 <laughs> series of standards for how AI gets deployed. So those resources are available. They have, it's a goal to make them more accessible to everyone. Yeah, and as it's been noted, right, a lot of these principles are very high level, right? Who is going to disagree with privacy or security or fairness at a high level? Um, you know, so a lot of the details are what are going to shed light on um, kind of the decisions being made. I would say, of course, technical details on implementation, but also what happens when some of these principles come into conflict with each other, right? How do you weigh them against each other? For us, we really wanted to write a set of principles that was very um, high level in terms of allowing room. We don't know exactly what the technology is going to look like in one year or 10 year, don't want to be too prescriptive in terms of you know what's dictated, but at the same time we want to give good guidance. So something that we've been looking at, as I mentioned, in the last three months, and we'll see how other companies um, and organizations do this too, is to really develop a case law of sorts, examples to say like, here's how we've interpreted it in this way, and here's how we interpreted you know, in this other situation to start building an example and a record of decision making. If I could just jump in here, I'm sorry. If I could just jump in here for a minute. Uh, the fundamental question underlying uh, the considerations that have just been put on the table is who decides, okay? Uh, it is absolutely the case uh, <laughs> that high-level general norms are going to come into conflict almost inevitably uh, with something that is going to have a range of effects. Who decides which one of those norms takes priority 
or how they're to be balanced. If you draw up, to vary you know, the decision metaphor just a little bit, suppose you draw up a list of what you consider to be social benefits and social costs from the development and deployment of a new technology. Let us say further what is almost always the case. These costs and benefits are, you know, uh, they don't have a common denominator. They are qualitatively different. Who, looking at those two lists, decides which way the balance inclines? Uh, there are some circumstances in which individuals make that decision, some circumstances in which the private sector makes those decisions. But for the kinds of issues that we're talking about, I think both history and logic suggest that there's also a role for the public sector in making these decisions. Uh, you know, so we talk about explainable AI. Explainable to whom? Right? And uh, I don't think that question, when posed, answers itself. Explaining to consumers is not necessarily enough because you know, of tragedy of the commons problems. That is, a transaction that is both explainable and attractive to individual, an individual consumer, when you multiply that by 100,000 or a million, generates a new social reality. So for example, New York City is now grappling with the fact that the proliferation of Uber and Lyft is contributing to traffic congestion, further traffic congestion, I shall say, which is measurably slowing traffic in New York City. That is an aggregate social consequence of individual technologically driven capacities that didn't exist 10 years ago. And I don't think that individuals or Uber or Lyft are going to decide the question as to whether that's an acceptable social outcome or not. At some point, New York City is going to have to make that decision. Public servants, elected representatives with all of their flaws. That's the only point I'm making through this entire discussion. You know, pretending that self-regulation is going to substitute fully for public judgments of this sort is, I think, a fool's errand, and that's the only point I'm making. Yeah, I would, oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I would just say completely agree with that. I think uh, there are a lot of different voices that need to be part of this discussion, including public sector, right? There's a lot of these shared decisions that we need to make together. Um, I will say kind of as different players are moving in organizations, some of them are taking time, right? What we have as a company at Google is opportunity to move on our own, and we are doing what we can in this area. Right. I think we also view this as doing our part in the ecosystem and not at all intending to exclude any other actors and, invite, in fact, inviting other actors to participate in the conversation with us, please. Um, just for one example, you mentioned New York City. I know that they're actively working right now with their, their they have an algorithmic decision-making task force um, that is going to, you know, decide. I, I, I think that they're tasked with understanding how potential AI implementations and adoptions within the city of New York, um, how that is working in practice, who will be affected by, uh, by those technologies. And um, so we think about explainability, explainability not only to technologists and to individuals within the companies, and end users, but explainable to governments, not just regulators, but um, cities and counties and states who may actually want to be purchasing and using these sorts of technologies. They have an obligation to the public to be able to understand, for example, how bus schedules get set or how public resources may be distributed or how sentencing guidelines might be decided upon. So absolutely in agreement that we all need to be talking here. Oh boy, um, <laughs> the hands have come up. Uh, I'm gonna take three quick questions and then uh, try and keep your questions very quick and then uh, that'll, that'll be it and then we'll have to wrap up. Um, first, over here. Thank you, uh, Yavan Oturno with the Interactivity Foundation. We organize public policy discussion among the general public and AI is one of the area we just started looking at. So my question to any of the panelists would be um, what questions you would, you would suggest the general public should be di discussing when they're looking at AI 
not so much today, but five, 10, 20 years later. Thank you. Hi there, Jay Jang with the American Bankers Association. So I wanted to ask about the fair lending and UDAP risks associated with the employment of uh, artificial intelligence, you know, so for example, in financial services, an area that we're very concerned is uh, where AI plays into underwriting or marketing and pricing. The fear is uh, in a way where AI can be used to limit offerings in a discriminatory way for people. So my question, whether it's in banking or more broadly, the deployment of AI across industries is how can we ensure we have transparency and fairness? And on the other side, you know, how can we prevent uh, AI from really exacerbating and making worse, let's say, the implicit biases that uh, we tend to have, you know, individually. How can AI, uh, how can we think about the issue? Thank you. I'm actually going to wrap it up with those two and give each of the panelists an opportunity, hopefully in about a minute, um, to answer one of the two questions. <laughs> um, so well, I can jump on the uh, uh, finance question uh, that this uh, gentleman uh, just asked. I think you're right in that AI does have the potential to exacerbate unfairness, inequality, and a host of, as well as bias and discrimination uh, issues. Uh, the great fear is that we will end up with digital redlining, that all the digital data actually will make it even clearer in terms of uh, problems that they're doing. That's the reason why I think in these types of areas, we do need non-discrimination <laughs> legislation to basically say, you can't do it that way. and. If companies are found to have violated that in the same way that banks in the past uh, engaged in traditional uh, redlining, then you know they are subject to uh, civil or even criminal action. Sure, I'll answer the first one on general public. I would say obviously there's some initial questions around you know how do you you know speaking to your audience feel about um, things like fairness where do you draw the line right even when we talk about fairness there aren't clear definitions for exactly what that looks like and if I asked myself versus you versus other people in the audience we might all have different explanations of what is fair for a given situation right so how do they think about that how should those types of decisions be made available be made accountable um, the same thing around explainability right what level of explainability is appropriate and for or what types of applications, for example. Um, if you use a product like Google Translate, sometimes it comes out with, um, most of the time it's pretty good, but sometimes it comes out with funny translations. And in that case, you know, usually you just kind of laugh and, and it's funny, but it's not as funny if it were in a case like a financial credit decision or a uh, medical decision, right? In that case, you probably want a much higher level of explainability. So I think it'd be really valuable for the public to be thinking about these things, um, impacts. Where do they draw the line? How would they assess this? What would be most useful? Um, and then I think the last thing I'd note is it'd be amazing if the general public was asking the question around how can I get involved? Right? And we talk a lot about AI for everyone, this opportunity that AI can bring. The last thing that we would want, of course, is for this to be something that increases inequality, right? There's so many opportunities, the barriers getting lower. Um, right now, you know, I don't know how to build a car. Probably most of us in the room don't know how to build one, but we can certainly drive one. We can operate one to get from where we need to um, go point A to point B. So same thing with AI. How can general, there's already kind of starting to be great models and pre-built APIs and things like that, but even better interfaces. How can the public get involved? What are the problems they care about? Even with government using AI to develop um, and deliver public services better, I think there's a lot of opportunities there. Very quickly, your banking and finance question raises a really profound issue, which I think ultimately will be a philosophical issue. And that is, is human judgment subject to algorithmic representation and reduction? I think the jury is very much out on that. And one of the things that we already know is that the effort to reduce lending practices to quantitative, uh, quantitative metrics has had the effect of disadvantaging lend borrowers, particularly small borrowers, who used to be the beneficiaries of what was known as relationship lending, 
where people received loans based on a loan officer's personal knowledge of the character and history of the prospective borrower, even if that borrower couldn't meet standard income and collateral standards. Uh, and I am, you know, and I think the step towards standard quantitative metrics for lending is clearly having asymmetric effects in for smaller borrowers and more remote borrowers who are increasingly f distant from increasingly com uh, concentrated financial entities as community banking disappears, for example. No relationship, no loan. So the, uh, the question of human judgment, and I think, cannot be taken out of the equation. I will also uh, answer the first question. So by way of analogy, I think about privacy. It's been challenging to figure out um, how individuals think about privacy uh, how much they care about privacy and how that gets manifested. So a popular you know, point of rhetoric is that individuals don't care about privacy, privacy is dead. Privacy researchers know that that isn't true. We know that when you look in, as I've said, particular contexts, the home, transportation, the workplace, people care very deeply about what information is being collected about them and how it's being used, who it's being transmitted to, and what control they have over that kind of information getting out. So similarly, it's difficult, I think, I, I also want to know more about how the public feels, uh, and I think it's really important for, the, for all of us to be asking and answering questions. It's difficult to say, how do you feel about artificial intelligence? I think it, it's important to be very specific um, in thinking about, you know, even something like face recognition technology, even within a particular context. Somebody might feel that it's fine for face recognition to be used in lieu of uh, badging in to their workplace. They might be wowed by the ability to walk up to an elevator and have that elevator take them up to the sixth floor where they work. They might be less excited if they realize that that same technology could be used to track their presence across a building, potentially evaluate their performance, their efficiency, um, and maybe with dire consequences. Maybe that could be linked to their pay or their chances of promotion. It's just it's important to develop case studies and be very careful about kind of what about the analytical framework of those case studies to make sure that you're really pulling out what it is that is um, making people feel uneasy. That's information that I think that we all need to have as we develop these technologies going forward. And I also say, I would also say it's important for all of us to realize that artificial intelligence is personal. The data that is being collected, that is in databases, that is being used to train machine learning algorithms, is about us. We're the ones who are supplying the data. We're the ones who are using the personal assistants and the smart lights and the smart light bulbs. And, and without our information, this is not going to happen. It's not going to work. So we need to all be aware of the role that we are playing in the ecosystem and decide whether we want to play that role and to what extent we want to do so. Thank you, Heather. That's a great note to end on. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here and for offering your wisdom and, and uh, ex expertise. Um, I want to thank you all as well for joining. And um, we didn't quite solve the problem necessarily, but I think we got, we got a good head start on transparency and explainability and accountability. So uh, thank you all. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.